Hey, hey, everybody. If you're listening to this, you are listening to the first free hour of this episode of The Shift with Doug McKinty. If you like what you're hearing, please consider subscribing to the show in order to access the full feature-length versions of the podcast, as well as have access to the members' forum, where we discuss potential topics and interviews and dive deep into the overall concept of The Shift. For only six bucks a month, not only do you get the full-length episodes, but also an opportunity to co-create with me, your host, Doug McKinty, the future of the show. Go to www.theshiftnow.com or patreon.com backslash the shift and sign up today in order to help make the shift possible. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Good morning, noon, or night, wherever and whenever you are listening, you are listening to The Shift. I am your host. My name is Doug McKenty. This episode was recorded on September 10th, 2020. Find out more about the program on YouTube and Facebook at The Shift with Doug McKenty, on Twitter at DMcKenty, or on the web at www.theshiftnow.com. My guest on the program today is alchemist and spigerics expert Phoenix Aurelius. For the last 14 years, Phoenix has been studying and teaching the lost arts of European alchemy, keeping alive a lineage that has been all but lost over the last 400 years of the scientific revolution. His philosophy offers an alternative for those of Western origin who seek a path of integrated and holistic symbiosis with the natural world, in contrast to the current dominant paradigm which posits that humans must dominate natural processes through objectification and control. Phoenix draws his inspiration from the works of Paracelsus, the 16th century alchemist who created a system of medicine known as spigerics, which uses a process of refining and recombining whole plant essences in combination with a diagnostic methodology that analyzes elemental imbalances and provides treatment protocols that cure disease through harmonization. The process requires more than just superficial knowledge and mechanical manipulation of natural resources, but demands a lifestyle dedicated to the principles applied in the laboratory. In order to achieve maximum purity of the extract, the alchemist must begin with the highest quality plant material. This understanding has led Phoenix to master the art of sustainable, organic, and biodynamic farming, as well as the work he does inside the lab, leading to a level of self-sufficiency rarely achieved in a world where most exist in dependence to a corporate system and serve as a cog in the wheel of the larger corporate government machine. The alchemy of Phoenix Aurelius is not a science in service to empire, but rather a spirit path that strengthens the practitioner as much as it heals the patient. While tinged with its own European flavor, the practice of spigerics has similarities with alchemical systems from all over the world. Phoenix works with traditional Chinese and Ayurvedic practitioners to better understand this worldwide vision of health, and has also spent time in the Amazon in order to learn more about traditional indigenous approaches to plant medicine. Perhaps it is time for those colonized into modernity to open their minds to the universal truths understood and recognized by all cultures throughout history. Phoenix has been doing his part to maintain this European tradition which perpetuates a philosophy and lifestyle in symbiosis with the state of nature. The time is now for those with European ancestry to remember their past and rejoin the world community through a deeper understanding of the European tradition that Phoenix espouses. Stay tuned for this interview that takes a deep dive into a European perspective that advocates for a holistic approach to living and provides a sustainable model for an existence in harmony with natural forces. This approach also aligns with universally accepted traditional cultural values while providing a unifying philosophy that has the power to reunite a post-colonial European heritage with the richness and diversity of cultures from around the world. Find out more about Phoenix's work at www.phoenixaurelius.com. And I want to thank Phoenix for agreeing to this interview and thank him for helping to make the shift. Hey, everybody, and welcome to this, the 52nd episode of The Shift. Uh, I'm your host, Doug McKenty, and this week I am joined with Phoenix Aurelius. He is a master alchemist, so I'm really looking forward to this one. Uh, We were just talking before the show. uh, I'm someone who's dabbled a little bit in manufacturing tinctures and making alcohol here and there, and uh, it's just always something I've been really interested in, and Phoenix was telling me so many people are like that, but to really take this kind of deep dive into the philosophy uh, and, and doing the research for this episode 
uh, Phoenix is the guy to talk to as far as I can tell. He really knows what he's doing. So I am looking forward to this one, uh, and I hope you are too. So stay tuned here, and we'll get into it. Phoenix, how are you doing today? Hey, doing great, Doug. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, again, I'm just looking looking forward to this. I mean, alchemy is such an ancient uh, concept, and it feels so... Well, it feels kind of foreign to everyone, I think, but I, at the same time, everybody, you know, certainly everybody drinks spirits or a lot of people do, and it's a part of our culture, but it's like we don't really know, um, you know, exactly what it is or where it comes from or how it fits into the bigger picture because it, it just, it's something that people did in the past. And um, it's so interesting to be able to talk to someone who's keeping their tr tradition alive. Uh, so, you know, we can get into that, but do you want to, discuss with people your history and just what interested you in learning more about alchemy and a little bit about how you got started on this path? Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. So, uh, yeah, as, as you introduced me, my name's Phoenix Aurelius. And uh, from the time I was just a kid, I was absolutely enthralled with the concept of making potions and medicines and, you know, love the herbs and, and crystals and all sorts of different types of things like that. And as I got older, uh, the the interest in those things became a little bit more refined and I got into kind of some, some really easy level herbalism and, and uh, started playing around with entheogens a little bit in, in uh, my latter years of high school. I think that was my senior year of high school. And, uh, you know, I wanted to be a pro skater, but I had dislocated my uh, ankle three times in a 90 day period. And so that kind of set me on this trajectory of like, yeah, you're probably not going to be doing this for too much longer. Otherwise, you're going to sustain some serious injuries. So um, what ended up happening was I went into the woods and and uh, also into my computer lab in, in high school. And I printed off this little sheet from the philosophers of nature. And all it said on there was philosophers of nature, how to make a spagyric tincture. And I think that this even was an image file. I don't even know if uh, PDFs were really a thing at that time. This is still in the days of 256K dialogue. And um, I ended up getting that, that uh, document and going up into nature and just using that flow chart and what I could uh, grasp, you know, like for instance, my, my crucibles that I would roast my herbs to an ash in, they were usually um, five finger discounted uh, stainless right. steel condiment <laughs> containers from restaurants, you know, it'd be like, Hey, can I have another ketchup? And they bring the ketchup. You just, <laughs> you know, steal it, uh, take, take the ketchup out and take the container with you. Um, it, and it was like really humble beginnings like that. You know, I wasn't 21. And so I had to have uh, friends go to the store for me and buy me uh, Everclear, which was the 95% alcohol that I had access to. Right. Um, and yeah, I just started working on various herbs uh, up in the woods by myself. And um, I didn't really even pay attention to what spagyric meant at the time, but I had been making uh, some spagyric tinctures. And um, it, later I had a friend uh, come uh, to, to my place that I was working at called Mojo's. And I would make these elixirs for people. Um, they would come in and they would tell me how they wanted to feel. And I had this entire herbal apothecary behind me of uh, various antigens and herbs. And I would just blend things up. They would tell me how they wanted to feel. And I'd make decoctions and infusions and add my little tinctures here and there. Mm -hmm. And I had one woman just say, man, these are, these are like out of this world potency. I've never experienced anything like this. And you're so young. Like maybe we could sit down and compare notes. We did. And she's the one who did the investigative research and told me, and this was probably in 2005 or 2006, and told me, you know what you're doing is called spagyrics. And I said, oh yeah, I heard that word. It's here on this flow chart. And uh, she said, wow, that's, that's really amazing. This is part of the alchemical tradition. And there was a guy who's teaching this. I don't know if he's still around or what happened, but you should search it out. And of course she was talking about the Paracelsus Research Society uh, mm -hmm. and Frater Albertus, who ran the largest alchemical school in the world here in Salt Lake City between uh, 1960 and 1984. And um, so I just started seeking out more and more practitioners. And shortly thereafter, uh, Dennis William Hauk had moved uh, the International Alchemy Guild from Austria, where it was uh, under the direction of Hans Schimmer. And he moved it to uh, Sacramento, California and started hosting international alchemy conferences. And so that was in 2007 when he started. And uh, I was able to meet a lot of people in 2007, 2008, 2009 at those international alchemy conferences. And uh, 
uh, things just kind of snowballed from there. And I've just been on a, on a path of uh, continuing to practice. And eventually I got Frater Albertus's secretary um, giving me, you know, donating to me a lot of labware and a tremendous amount of resources that she had collected from her time with uh, Frater Albertus of the Paracelsus Research Society as his secretary, as well as uh, Jean Dubuis of the Philosophers of Nature and um, all of the, the texts in English of the Philosophers of Nature that were put together by Russ and Sue House. So that, and I think that happened in 2010. So that really fast-tracked my, my evolution, was able to kind of go really deep into the practical uh, laboratory aspects of, of the work, mm -hmm. that if I hadn't inherited those resources, I, I doubt that I would be where I'm at today. So um, yeah, that was, that's kind of like a little snippet of, of how I got interested in all of this and kind of where I'm at today with it. And so uh, what uh, can you go into what exactly does spigerics mean then? It's a term that I've heard uh, a bit in my dabblings, but, you know, I barely get beyond just kind of using a still uh, to do a, a little bit of tincture making or extractions. Um, and so what does that term spigerics mean and how is it different from just, you know, what people kind of hear about or, you know, using a, using a still doing a little bit of distillation? Sure. Yeah. So uh, spagyrics is actually a term created by the founder of Spagyria, whose name is Paracelsus, and uh, it comes from two ancient Greek. He was really great at creating words, by the way. He created a tremendous mm. vocabulary for the alchemical paradigm, but Spagyria comes from two ancient Greek words. One is called spagere, which means to separate, and then the second is agiros, which means to recombine. And so it's a kind of a combination of those two words, spagire, agiros, or spagiric. Um, and basically spagiria, it, it means just that, to separate and recombine. In Latin, there's a term that uh, is used to define this work. It means solve et coagula in Latin, which means quite literally to dissolve or to separate and then to coagulate or put the, put the pieces back together again. And realistically, you know, if you talk to most uh, alchemists and spagyrists, they'll tell you that there's a third process hidden in there, which is to purify. So it's to separate, to purify each of the things that you've separated, and then add all of those purified uh, components back together again in such a way that you are removing the dross. And what spagyria has come to mean, as defined by, by Paracelsus himself, is an entire pharmacopoeia of, of medicine that is used um, by, by basically using alchemical cosmology and using alchemical philosophy and practices in order to create very advanced items of, uh, items of spagyric pharmacopoeia. And um, they differ drastically from remedies all across the world because they actually are what we would refer to in modern day terms as iatrochemical meaning that they actually use, utilize the very same technology that's used in modern day pharmaceutical uh, methodologies. And in fact, modern pharmaceuticals actually kind of ripped the idea off, so to speak, from uh, spagyric remedies. And that's where they have their source. The only difference is, is that with spagyria, we're using you know, herbs, minerals, animal products, uh, metals, it's water, et cetera in order to be able to create the remedies and doing everything what we would call endogenously, meaning what is found inside of a single substance is what goes back into that substance in order to make that iatrochemistry. And pharmaceuticals will draw things from all over the place. So they might take a source of magnesium uh, oxide, for instance, and bind that to some synthetic material that they have synthesized in, in the laboratory in order to create a, a modern or they might extract it out of a more commercially viable material um, like a mold or something like that in order mm -hmm. to be able to make it instead of getting it from nature in a sustainable amount. And, you know, of course, that's mostly just a monetary prerogative for why they do that. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Um, as my listeners will know, I uh, have spent some time in the cannabis industry. And so that's where a lot of my experience in, in doing uh, extractions of the cannabinoids. But um, and then I, I did have a friend that we play around with a little bit, you know, some of this and he he's inherited a, a decent lab set actually from a friend of his as well. And he's in the process of setting that up. But he's gone to the to the uh, 
to the lengths of actually creating, I, I guess what you would call the, the cannabis stone where you take yeah. the, you know, you, you take the, uh, you, you can extract the oils, but then, and, and the essential oils, and then you burn down the cannabis plant in the, in the crucible, and then you recombine these things all together. And it's all comes, every bit of it, every part of it comes from the same plant. Um, I was listening to uh, one of your old uh, videos on YouTube, actually, and you were talking about making some, some, um, some lemon elixirs from the lemon plant and going as far as to even make ideally even making the alcohol that you're using from the lemon plant that and then maybe using the peels or whatever else to to continue to uh, refine uh, the essence of the lemon and then recombining all of that together um you want to just describe a little bit of this process i mean i'm doing i i barely know what i'm talking about so you, you wow. know, go into for, it <laughs> yeah well for barely knowing what you're talking about you're actually doing a pretty good job cool and, yeah, as it relates to cannabis, let's let's actually stick on that one because that's one of the very best ones sure. uh, that I like to teach people on because it lends itself so well to the processes of spagyria, both beginning processes and, and later more advanced processes. Mm -hmm. So basically in spagyria, there's this concept that everything contains a soul, a spirit, and a body, or what we would call alchemical sulfur, mercury, and salt. And again, when we say sulfur, mercury, and salt, we're talking about archetypes uh, of the materials, we're not necessarily talking about brimstone, meaning sulfur or metallic mercury. I mean, we don't think that uh, everything contains metallic mercury and sodium chloride and sulfur uh, in there. What mm -hmm. we're talking about are archetypes that stand for um, broader kind of like macro elements that exist inside of everything. And so in the plant kingdom, there are really two different grades of sulfur. There's what we call fixed sulfur, and then there's what we call volatile sulfur. Fixed sulfur is equivalent to uh, the hair color, the eye color, the skin color, the way that uh, the, the material dresses, um, the sound of its voice, like all of those things would kind of basically be the fixed sulfur. And they have a tremendous amount of medicinal potency too, because they have an identity of the plant. So the sulfur in general is where the identity of the plant and the healing medicinal virtue of the plant really sits. Um, and so like anybody who's ever taken a tincture or drunk a tea has uh, an intimate level of experience with what the fixed sulfur is. It's the coloring agent of that herb. And oftentimes, like in the case of cannabis, what you're extracting, like you said, are the terpenoids or the cannabinoids in mm -hmm. the case of cannabis. So your CBD, your THCs, your CBG, you know, all of all of the different cannabinoids that show up inside of the cannabis plant are typically ethanol soluble and are able to be extracted, um, you know, through through that particular uh, method of extraction of tincturing or what we call maceration. But then um, also, and I was I was fortunate enough and privileged enough about seven to ten years ago to start teaching people, the very first people in the industry, to do it how to be able to. Uh, perform a distillation and a separation of the what we call the terpenes or the essential oils mm -hmm. of the cannabis plant. And, um, and seeing where it's gone now after just showing the first couple of people who would take them to trade shows and cannabis conventions and stuff is really kind of cool knowing that I had some hidden hand in just teaching interested people who would hire me to do this. But right. essentially what you do is you take an herb and there's two different ways of, of performing an essential oil distillation. One is called a hydro distillation. That's where you set your herb inside of a flask and you pour water over the top of it and then bring everything to a boil. So that's the first kind and that's called a hydro distillation. <clears throat> hydro distillation. The second kind is called a steam distillation. And that's where you are taking a flask that has uh, water inside of it and, and boiling that water so the steam vapor rise up and then they pass through a second flask that's known as a, either a chromatography reservoir or a uh, biomass flask sometimes. And you, that's where you have all of your herbal material. And all of that vapor comes up through that material. And as it does so, it lifts out the molecules of terpenes that are in there. And uh, then they're able to distill over. And then you just have to separate out what's known as the hydrosol from the essential oil. Mm -hmm. and the hydrosol is like an herbal infused water and it's completely clear. It just has the scent of that particular herb. And the essential oil has all of the terpene profile of that particular herb that you're working with. So this would be, you know, like your uh, linalool and 
um, you know, uh, myrcene and pinene and all of these other different types of, of uh, terpenes that actually lend the, the unique smell to the cannabis. And these are what we would call the volatile sulfur. And the reason that they're called the volatile sulfur is because they, on their own, don't really have that much healing capacity when, taking, uh, when taken internally. They lend to the potency drastically when they're combined with the terpenoids or with the cannabinoids. So it's uh, like, for instance, when you smoke THC, um, especially Delta-9 THC, the myrcene content of a plant will actually lend to the duration and the pleasantness and the enjoyability of the high that you get from that delta nine. And so if the, the terpene profile isn't in there, those essential oils aren't in there, so there's no myrcene or negligible levels of it, then it becomes a more flat kind of experience. Uh, for a lot of individuals. And uh, that's true when smoking it. It's also true when taking it uh, internally. So th those are the two grades of sulfur that we have. And then mercury is uh, produced. You can use what's known as endogenous mercury. Endogenous mercury would be uh, a mercury or an alcohol, a plant spirit that is fermented from just the plant itself. So you would take cannabis and ferment the cannabis inside of water and then uh, whatever amount of uh, alcohol that that ferment ends up having, you would distill that out and purify it uh, through a series of seven different distillations. And you'd purify it to be 95% ethanol. And just like you can tell the difference between uh, a spirit at 95% uh, that's been taken from corn or uh, molasses, or you know, any of these other types of plants like grain, like uh, barley, for instance, malted barley. Mm -hmm. You can smell that it came from the plant. You can taste that it came from the plant that it came from. That's known as endogenous um, spirits. And typically that's, that's like the most preferred and the highest level of, uh, of the work. But it is relatively difficult to get certain herbs that are antibacterial, antiviral, et cetera, in order to ferment. So sometimes you'll add an extra bit of sugar or you'll use um, maybe sometimes the hydrosol uh, from the essential oil distillation as the water component of your ferment so that Interesting. Um, you're able to get a lot of that uh, essence in there. But the concept behind an endogenous ferment is that every plant contains the yeasts on the outside of it that are necessary for breaking down that particular plant. And so instead of just going to, uh, you know, Levan or any of these other companies and making um, a particular ferment using their yeast, you try and seclude the yeasts that are very specifically from the plant that you're trying to ferment. And that's the whole concept. And in some cases, some plants just really don't like to ferment uh, in a way that they produce very much alcohol. And so for practical purposes, a lot of times people will use what's known as an exogenous spirit. Mm -hmm. And an exogenous spirit would be like taking uh, cane spirits, for instance, so like what I use, 100% organic cane spirits, and um, using that for the extraction uh, of an herb and then distilling out that spirit um, after you've made the tincture. And what that does is it takes the essential oil content and the identity of that spirit and it infuses it and binds it intrinsically uh, to the, the ethanol that you're using. And so it's kind of like a shortcut path to be able uh, to get uh, your mercury determined is a word that we use, uh, determined to that particular plant or herb. Mm -hmm. And that gives us uh, our vegetable mercury, or at least our volatile mercury. There are ways of creating vinegars as well that are used in, in more advanced processes of the work. And then finally, uh, you take all of the material that you steam distilled and all of the material that you've extracted and all of the material that you've maybe fermented and worked with, and you dry it out and then you calcine it. And calcination is a process of basically roasting uh, the herbal material over a very, very hot fire until it gets as white of an ash as possible. And then from that ash, you utilize distilled water. Uh, distilled rainwater is the, the standard that is ideal. Um, and you continually leach uh, the minerals out from that ash and purify those minerals over and over and over until you reach about 99% uh, or higher 
uh, pure potassium carbonate is what comes out. And that's, that's true of almost the entire plant kingdom is that uh, about 90% of the plant kingdom reduces down to potassium carbonate when you leach its ash. And so at, at length, what you would end up having are uh, four real starting materials that go into making a stone or a tincture or an essence or different items of uh, beginning level spagyric pharmacopoeia. And those would be your essential oil, which we call the volatile sulfur, the plant extract, which is known as the fixed sulfur. Then you would also have some form of mercury, whether endogenous or exogenous, it really doesn't matter, um, just as long as it's infused with the identity of that herb. And then the potassium carbonate from that herb. And uh, the proportion that you add these in and how you add them back and when you add them back and what you might do uh, to them ultimately ends up determining what item of spagyric pharmacopoeia you're, you're able to create and on what level it impacts a person. So if you have a higher level of essential oils, uh, especially like with cannabis, if you have a high level of essential oils and none of the terpenoids, now that's actually going to just be a psychological remedy. So it'd be your essential oils, your you know ethanol uh, that, that is infused with a plant and potassium carbonate. If you add all those together, that's going to create what we call a philosophic spagyric essence. And that's not going to have any of the cannabinoids. It's only going to have the terpenes, the ethanol and the potassium carbonate in it. And that will work on a more psychological level that actually interacts with the limbic brain, which interfaces with the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Hmm. And this is how it really begins to work on a more psychological level. It begins to balance the psyche in ways that are equivalent to the molecular components that that particular medicine has. Whereas if we were to leave the essential oil out or leave it out in mo you know, mostly, because if you take fresh herb and you extract it with ethanol, some of the essential oils actually dissolve inside of that ethanol, but you're not performing a complete essential oil distillation in order to seclude them and get them uh, on their own. So what would end up happening is that you'd have a small amount of essential oils, you'd have a very large amount of terpenoids or cannabinoids would be another term for that your ethanol and your, uh, uh, your potassium carbonate, when those are added back, that would create a spagyric tincture. And that spagyric tincture then is going to uh, act mostly on the body because it's the terpenoids, the cannabinoids that are getting inside of the system. And then whatever essential oil was extracted through that process of, of maceration and tincturing just really lends to the potency of the cannabinoid. So it works less on a psychological level and much more on a physiological level. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's basis like that, uh, that we work with acknowledging that everything ultimately has sulfur, mercury, and salt and the ways that you extract them, what you decide to do with that herb, uh, you know, and like, for instance, if we wanted to make a uh, rose or lemon balm into a spagyric product, Rose and lemon balm for most people's setups are not going to be able to be distilled in enough quantity in order to produce any good quality uh, essential oil. Like you have to have so much biomass in order to do that. So mm. that herb might lend itself a little bit better to uh, the tincturing process or to later processes known as the prima mens or, you know, other things like that. Whereas uh, something like cannabis is very versatile and you can make a lot of things from it, but it doesn't work so very well with the prima mens tinctureing process. And so every herb needs to be listened to in order to derive an item or multiple items of pharmacopoeia that uh, are unique to its particular healing uh, properties and, and signatures. Yeah, this is fascinating. Um, I, I want to get into, well, a little bit of the history. Maybe we could talk about Paracelsus a little bit. And especially, you know, at what point does this separate out from modern science and how, how do these two things compare? And, and then I guess where I'm going with this too is I'd like to, to flush out because at some point, Western science essentially becomes very materialistic. And yet in this alchemical practice, there's this whole spiritual uh, understanding um, more, more like a, a, an Ayurvedic system or a traditional Chinese medical system, um, where there are these different layers going on. So just in terms of the European lineage, you know, what happens, um, initially, I guess maybe we could get into, again, the philosophy of, of Paracelsus and these alchemists 
what what is that around the 1600s or so and then and then how does science come out of that and and when and why does that happen oh yeah that's those, that's a really great topic in fact one of my favorite things to nice, talk about. yeah <laughs> so paracelsus um in my opinion is kind of the pinnacle of western alchemy uh it really he he brought so many things from the historical past and polished them up, perfected them, elaborated on them, wrote very prolifically. And it was his work that really becomes the basis of what we now have inherited today as modern alchemy. And so, uh, yeah, Paracelsus not only just created the items of pharmacopoeia, he even went so far as to tell his contemporaries, hey, stop trying to make uh, the transmutation of metals and searching for the, the elixir of life, none of those things are really that important. You have the ability to be able to heal people using the skills that you have and make medicines of profound virtue. So why don't you do that? You can make an honest living doing that. And that's really kind of where the concept of Spagyria came from. He was very, very, very passionate about healing people. And so using uh, alchemical wisdom, he was healing things like syphilis and the plague and mm -hmm. um, you know leprosy and other really intense diseases that still, um, still plague humanity in a certain regard today. And he did so entirely before the scientific revolution using only empirical data as proof for uh, what you know, for all of his theories, he says, here's my theory. He works it out, fleshes it out, goes ahead and, and performs experiments and sees like, okay, this actually legitimately gets rid of leprosy. And uh, he was constantly trying to teach people in his own time about how to do this. And, you know, we know the way that it is with modern establishments of any sort. And it was no different in, in Paracelsus's day that money and tradition and the church and governmental agencies and, and things like this, they, they form boards and they, they work in such a way that their, their knowledge can't really be contested. And if it is, then it goes against the grain and, you know, subject to legal penalties and all these other things. And mm -hmm. he, he underwent a tremendous amount of that. So his work was critical because he was actually the person who took alchemical theory and cosmology from the Arabic alchemists of the, you know, area of, era of about 600 to 900, maybe even a little later than that uh, AD. And alchemy actually made its way in through the southern tip of Spain, through the Moorish connection, and started uh, spreading out into the rest of Europe. Uh, that way, starting realistically in about the 1200s, but it wasn't really, you know, notar notarized until about the 1300s. And Paracelsus was born in uh, uh, around 1490, and he died roughly in about 1540. And um, he died actually because somebody bludgeoned him in the head from behind. So mm -hmm. he didn't die of natural causes; otherwise, right. he would have lived quite a great time afterwards. But uh, so, you know, there was several hundred years of alchemy already being practiced in all these different traditions. And, um, you know, there's no unified tradition of Western alchemy. Uh, certain authors will read other authors and they kind of build upon those and elaborate upon those. But it would be damn near impossible to be able to collect all of the uh, texts that have been written about alchemy and create a unified tradition out of that. They're just been so many ideas and there hasn't hasn't really been common vocabulary to discuss most of those ideas so jabir or al jabir or sometimes just known as geber g-e-b-e-r in the west he was an arabic alchemist who created the concept of the sulfur mercury theory that there are these duality principles um, inside of things where he said that sulfur was the masculine and, and mercury was the feminine. By the time Paracelsus got to those and started really working on those concepts and theories, he said, well, that's not really true. And he said, what about all these powders that you alchemists are making? Do you not consider those to be another principle? And so he said, I do. Those are another principle. Those we call salts. And so he said that salt is actually the most passive of all of those principles, and that's actually feminine, and that sulfur is the most active of those principles, and that's actually masculine, and it's the mercury that is hermaphroditic that can combine either with the sulfur or with the salts, depending on what the mercury is composed of, 
and it leads those two together. It's kind of the bridge between heaven and earth, if mm. you want to think of it like that. And uh, that's why it's also known as Mercury. It's the messenger of the gods, so to speak. And it, it translates those messages. Yeah, that's interesting just to say, um, because I do I do Tai Chi, so I'm familiar, most familiar with the traditional Chinese system and you, you know we're looking at the yin and the yang and the middle path or things like that different different uh traditions that have different ways of describing it but but still uh, similar methodologies here yeah exactly you know tcm follows very closely because they have yin and yang which uh what we would call in alchemy the celestial salt would be the yin and the celestial niter would be the yang or the active principle and then from those uh, you also have three really unique principles of Jing, Qi, Sen. And those three uh, principles relate very, very closely to uh, alchemical sulfur, mercury, and salt. In fact, if in some traditions, um, though they can be used almost synonymously. Cool. Um, and the Taoists had their own alchemy uh, practices too, long before... Uh, modern, what we would call TCM, Maoist TCM ever was a thing. The ancient Taoists, they were using three different cauldrons in order to sublimate different metals and materials in different fluids. And they came up with some very unique uh, kinds of materials that were very comparable to what was produced in India and then in, in the West as well, you know, which when we talk about the West, we're talking about really the Far East, or uh, sorry, the Near East, and uh, into uh, Egypt, and then finally into Greece, and then to mainland Europe, and so on and so forth that way. So the the practices all around the world are very, very similar. It's just, again, there were no common core terminology that was ever used. And then Paracelsus came around, he started creating terminology left and right, and he tried mm -hmm. to, for as best as he possibly could in his day, again, pre-scientific revolution, several hundred years before the scientific revolution, ended up creating all of these terms and processes to be able to speak about things in a way that added to and drove the complexity of the Aristotelian thought of just everything's composed of four primary elements or humors, uh, the way that they would have taught about it in his day. And he spoke very heavily against the humor saying that, you know, yes, there are four elements in everything, but they don't show up in the way that the humors uh, show up. And if they did, then the medicinal practitioners of that day would have been, uh, had a much greater success rate. And instead of killing 90% of the patients that they were working with, they would have actually healed them. And Paracelsus was an advocate, uh, very much so an advocate against the Galenic and Hellenic systems of healing showing instead, hey, look, we have a much higher success rate with uh, alchemical processes. But he ran into a tremendous amount of resistance during his day, primarily because people couldn't wrap their mind around what was called chemical medicine. So today we call it chemical, but in the past it's spelled chemical, C-H-Y-M-I-C-A-L-L. -L. Chemical medicines were uh, medicines that were produced through spagyric or alchemical uh, philosophies. And they said that they were such poisonous substances that they would never be able to, to be able to heal somebody. And Paracelsus said, well, you know, you have to understand that it's the dose that makes the poison mm -hmm. or the medicine. And so that's where we really come with that concept. That was a quote directly from Paracelsus, that it's the dose that makes something a poison or a medicine. And, uh, you know, so after he died or rather got assassinated, what ended up happening was that uh, multiple different people would fall in his footsteps. Uh, we had a lot of different physicians that are known as the Paracelsian physicians as we look back in modern history. And they had for about 150 years after his death in the 1540s, an extreme high level of success rate in healing their patients and clients, even though it was still very much so taboo to be prescribing uh, chemical medicines. But all of the best philosophers and chemists, they all relied on the works of Paracelsus and maybe a, a few of his other contemporaries too, like uh, Raymond Lully, uh, who wrote Lully's Spirit of Wine and John French, The Art of Distillation, all of these other uh, different types of contemporaries. And that's what they would be teaching largely in the universities at that time. And uh, you know, fast forward to the end of the 1600s and beginning of the 1700s, you start to get people like uh, 
Jean Baptiste von Helmont. You start to get people like Robert Boyle and Lavoisier and all of these other people that we now look back to as kind of uh, figureheads in the development of modern chemistry. And they were saying, you know what, there's no way that there's actually only four elements in these three philosophical uh, essentials. And I believe it was, it was uh, uh, von Helmont who was writing a book called The, Skepti uh, the Skeptical Chemist. And he was basically saying, hey, look, I've practiced this. I know this. I know that it works. So it's not that these things don't work, but there's got to be a better explanation for how and why they work. And we have to go beyond just the concepts of uh, these four elements and these three philosophic essentials and stuff like that in order to make good sense of what is happening beyond the scenes. And that eventually led to straying away from alchemy and feeling that alchemy was very... Um, it was so tapped into superstition for them, the same way that Maoist TCM practitioners started to look at the old Taoist text saying, oh, you don't have to actually do these internal meditations because the, the chemical reactions that you see or the, the works when you're just performing it physically, they're, they're enough. They do what we're looking for. You don't have to have the psychological and the spiritual components along with this. And uh, there's better ways of describing it. And of course, if anybody who reads through any of Paracelsus's work, which most of it's in German, unless you buy very, very expensive translations from Andrew Weeks, um, what ends up, what, what you end up seeing is that uh, Paracelsus' reasoning for doing everything was based on his own cosmology of a neo-Christianic uh, kind of divinity, a, a divinatory model of modern Christianity. And he went very much so against the grain of uh, the papal narrative of Christ. And uh, that, that didn't really stand and lend in his favor. Um, but people tried to compare him because he was a contemporary of Martin Luther. And uh, they tried to compare him to Luther, or tried to compare him to the Huguenots and other different groups that were kind of Protestant for me. And he said, no, that's not what I'm talking about at all. You guys account for yourself and I'll account for myself. But he had these philosophies that said, listen, if something works in the laboratory, the way that the imagery shows itself is actually the parable that is teaching us how something happens and how it actually happened. And so he would look at scripture and he would use Jesus's life and, and the scriptures, uh, you know, the, of the New Testament in particular, as the exemplar model of the way that the laboratory work should be run. Like for instance, when we're talking about uh, making the salt, so we have to burn the ashes. This is equivalent to Jesus descending to hell for three days and raising people back up from the dead. Um, as it talks about in scripture. And so he had to first descend into hell for three days, which meant a calcination period in the fires of hell for three days. Mm -hmm. Then you come back out of that and then you visit John the Baptist who will baptize you and so on and so forth over and over and over. So that all of the elucidations uh, that were seen in the, in the New Testament scriptures actually were a model for how to perform the laboratory work and where there were discrepancies in the order of things. That's when Paracelsus would say, eh, I actually disagree with the way scripture is coming across these days. I think that they've tampered with it because in the laboratory, it happens like this. And he felt that the Christ was the ideal model of the perfect alchemist mm -hmm. on a spiritual level. And so everything that was going to be transformed or transubstantiated, to use uh, church terminology, was essentially had to follow that model. And so if, if something happened in the laboratory that uh, had any discrepancy from the scriptures, then he would say it was actually the scriptures that were wrong because he was able to demonstrate how it happened in the laboratory. And it was close enough to the scriptures that, and he drew his, his uh, inspiration from those that you couldn't deny that th there was some sort of spiritual makeup to it, but his reasonings for why everything worked, okay, from a, uh, why this particular type of healing works when you take this medicine to this, to that, to that, it's all very religiously based uh, in cosmology, just to Paracelsus that he had worked out and understood. And so by the time more people in Europe started practicing this, it was either one of two things had to be true. Either you had to follow Paracelsus's logic and try and deduce what he was talking about theologically in order to understand alchemy properly, or 
they had to try and say, you know what, there is some better explanation for why these things work beyond just, you know, these religious semantics uh, of Paracelsus and these other authors. Um, and what are those? And they started to develop the concept of chemistry or what they again called chemistry at that point that was starting to distinguish itself very heavily from alchemy saying, you know what, we followed these processes and the processes work, but the way that we're trying to explain them is different. And in so doing, they tried to distinguish themselves so much that the meditations and the psychological visualization processes, the internal purification process that happens as a result of that, that all kind of started to fall by the wayside. And they focused so heavily just on the physical processes of things that this is how the birth of chemistry, as we know it, uh, kind of came to be. And the, you see that it's really just from the stigma of being too much like alchemy that science, uh, as we see it today, and scientific inquiry and, and chemistry especially, differ so much from alchemy. And, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's the basis of that. Well, yeah, I, if I could just interrupt you for a second, because this is actually really fascinating for me. Um, like my Tai Chi teacher, we almost exclusively do only internal work. <laughs> we don't even mess with the, with the more materialistic side of it. And I have, you know, I have other TCM, my, my, my acupuncturist, of course, she's an herbalist and she does uh, all of that. And, and so I know that's a, a part of it, but we're kind of very strictly on the internal side. And I've had this experience and it took me, you know, coming from, Uh, having been raised in the West and learning this materialistic philosophy uh, quite some time performing the, the uh, Qigong and the other exercises, the Tai Chi and the Bagua and and whatnot to come to the conclusion that there actually is, you know, in the Taoism, you're probably familiar with what they call the microcosmic orbit. Yeah. But the, and then the, the variety of different meridians. I mean, I, after doing the work like it's what what's interesting for me is that i've had this experience where i do have uh empirical knowledge because i i you can feel the energy i mean you can actually you you can do it and you can use it and i mean again as a as a westerner it took me a while i mean my teacher used to just tell me like you still don't believe in this do you you know like after (laughs) after five years of studying with the guy and it's and i had to be like well i really it's so hard to but eventually um you know, right now, in terms of the internal practice, like I feel like I can apply Western empiricism. I mean, I get it. It's not objective. I can't show it to somebody else. But empirically, I do know I can do experiments, you know, internally and feel it myself and prove it to myself that it that it's actually real. So it's, it's just interesting to me the way that, um, you know, the Western consciousness kind of evolved out of and away from the internal work. And I get that it's hard to teach other people, you know, how to do it. But at the same time, and I think your experience with with your alchemical practice has been the same. And we can talk about, like I, in doing research for this, your your work in biodynamic agriculture. Um, and I also want to talk about, actually, let's get into some of, some of the more spiritual concepts behind uh, Paracelsus diagnostics and and how he defined disease and then how you know how do you relate what medicine for what symptoms and that kind of thing um because he does it gets into this cosmology and more of these these spiritual concepts um but i just wanted to butt in there for a second and 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 describe you know my personal experience with the eastern tradition at least um and then it's almost funny I could bring up too i mean I've done a few uh, sweat lodges in the Lakota tradition where you you become the thing inside the still right when you're doing a sweat lodge yeah. like they take it to that level so uh it's just yeah. so interesting to me this is something I enjoy is comparing different different cultures uh, and how and how they experience um you know the spiritual work and then so fascinating that in the western tradition they just discarded it, you know, and why did this happen? It's just so uh, amazing to me to the point now where, you know, most people raised inside the West, uh, they want to be so objective uh, about everything and they're not looking internally um, yeah. that they just don't even believe that it exists. It's it's fascinating to me when, again, you know, after my experience with Tai Chi, it's like clearly it exists. I use it all the time. I, I know uh, I can prove it scientifically. It's like to me, it's a it's a science that you're you're working with. But even the word spirituality, where in most cultures would mean this science of internal work and how the internal energy works, 
uh, to a Westerner implies some kind of woo woo, you know, <laughs> something that's just a mystical idea that doesn't have any real practical application, unless maybe you just feel, you know, you're going to church and you're being a spiritual person, but it's not, you know, there's not a, like a, it's not a, it, there's nothing, there's not a scientific application of, of a spiritual energy that actually can be used uh, for healing or for self-defense or for all of these other things. It's just not thought of like that anymore. I know. It's it's actually so bizarre to me that the practice of alchemy became so distanced from what we now experience as chemistry. If the two had continued on the same course, incorporating into the uh, chemical tradition, the internal processes that are happening, I think that we would have a much richer tradition of chemistry today because mm -hmm. it's, you know, we can see the chemistry works. Okay. So whatever the model is, whatever the way that they're thinking about it is uh, the, the, the results actually come up the same. So really the only difference between the alchemical mindset and the chemical mindset to be, you know, completely frank is finding the corollaries that happen on the psychological and then also on the spiritual level. And mm -hmm. really, you know, for, so soul would be your psyche, okay? So that would be what we would call mind. And, you know, if you aren't changing the way that you think about things or changing the way that you approach things or changing the nature of yourself and your own psyche over time, then there's a certain stagnancy that, that stays there that uh, will influence the work in one way or the other. And that's the skepticism that most people have in the West is a, I would call that a stagnant psyche. Sure. Because they're not experimenting like you are. Um, so to take anything that's foreign, you know, whether that's Tai Chi or, you know, yoga or any of these other practices and to begin to perform them at first, there's this huge learning curve that the mind has to go through first, just to learn the positions or the asanas, to learn the movements, to learn all of those different types of aspects of it. But then there's also the visualization aspect, and that's really what moves the psychic energy or the psyche. And this is where you are not just performing the movement, but you're actually feeling the energy that moving the T, moving the prana right. as you're performing the either the positions or the asanas or whatever. And it's a visualization. It's not something that's just going to happen if you just inherently practice the movement. You're never just going to tap into that. You have to be aware of the subtle energetic currents that are moving through there. And that's how they were first discovered. Right. But then in order to teach that, you have to visualize that in order to, to make that something that you can actually feel. Because unless you can conceive of something being there, you're not going to notice it. Observation is creation. And we know that from a quantum perspective these days. So everything in the West is coming back around to what we already knew. Well, it's starting. It seems like quantum physics is starting to, and and a lot of the cutting edge science is actually breaking through this old materialistic paradigm. And I just can't wait for the rest of the culture to catch <laughs> up. You know, it's like, know, come on, people, this is ridiculous. What are you? Yeah, thinking? <laughs> give me both. Although you know, it's yeah. it's very encouraging because there is a huge alchemical renaissance happening right now. I, you know, over the cool. past two or three years, we have, you know, maybe 200,000 people or so that have reached out just to me individually. Oh, wow. They're hearing me on podcasts and yeah. on, on things like this, where they're like, wow, what you said really resonated with me. I want, I want that. I crave that. And in fact, if, from my perspective, because I spent so many years in the Eastern traditions, uh, dabbling around and trying to find purpose of spirituality in my mm, life mm. only to come full circle to realize that the West actually has its own tradition of doing that. And I feel so many people in the West uh, would actually understand the alchemical processes better because it's in your epigenetic history. It's in what has surrounded you for thousands of years actually, and is already innately encrypted into the way that you think about things. When we talk about in the West, there's four elements. Okay. When you go into Taoist cosmology, they have five elements and yeah. it's like, wait, aren't metal and wood and earth all just earth, you know, right. the Western <laughs> cosmology, that's the way we think of it. Um, in the Taoist cosmology, not so because they'd say, well, Earth is what the tree grows out from and metal is what chops down the tree. So are those the same thing? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, 
so, you know, there's, there's little differences like that, but I feel that so many people are coming back to the hermetic model, which really is the, the jewel of the West that people can, can right. dive back into. Well, and I think that the West needs its own way. I mean, we can't just copy other people and it's, it's almost yeah. so sad that we've gotten off track. And I think actually, um, you know, without these cosmologies, like you're talking about that, this is why our culture is so destructive of the environment too. Like we don't yeah. have a spirituality that allows us to function in harmony with the state of nature. And so what we're doing is not in balance and it's going to eventually cause, you know, disease, right? It's going to cause a lot of problems, which we're witnessing exactly. every day. And I don't think, unfortunately, enough people don't realize, um, that it's a spiritual change that needs to happen in the West in order to, like, I think people are looking for political or economic changes and it's really like, no, our That's sense of starts, perception yeah. has to change. Exactly. Yeah. The economic and the governmental and all of the, you know, every, every other system that we create creates from inside of us. So unless we change our internal environments first, the mm. external environments will not follow. And it would be completely absurd to try and create external environmental change without uh, that's going to be better without knowing what that is from the internal level. And I think that uh, this is where people really need to get back to. So, you know, with, um, you know, we were touching upon um, Paracelsian kind of concepts of, of medicine and things like that. Um, I think that it's really important that people realize that uh, your psyche or your soul is a major area that we need purification in. And to be absolutely candid and practical, this comes down to first, there's lots of levels that can happen, but the very first thing is processing your traumas. Once you take all of the traumas inside of your life and you end up processing those, you learn that you are acting from a new place. What drives you is coming from a new place. It's no longer being driven from avoiding more traumatic situations. Right, right. Uh, from, fight or flight. Exactly. Yeah. Or freeze, you know, is the third, right. <laughs> you know, fight, flight or freeze. Sure. Um, we now have the opportunity to make conscious decisions as to what we want to engage in free from those traumatic experiences. And that is a whole liberating aspect to the psyche that um, most people really haven't experienced. And if they were just to get a taste of that, I think that they would be addicted to <laughs> eliminating their, their right. traumatic experiences, sure. you know, it becomes an obsession. But then once you do that, then that's what opens up the way for spirit to actually move through you and to flow. And what spirit really is, you cultivate your spiritual self by developing disciplines. And so Tai Chi, discipline, Qigong, disciplines, mm -hmm. lab work, disciplines, right. all of these things are ways that you channel your spirituality. And if you are channeling your spirituality only through your religion at the present moment, then once you free your psyche from traumas and don't need to have answers implanted by religion, now your hike through the forest every day, whatever you do every day, that's going to be your discipline. And you will find entirely new insights that are driven uh, and that animate you. That's, that really is what, what the goal of spirit really is, is to give power or force to the psyche. And the reason that you have a body is to be able to, uh, act that volition of the psyche out through a physical model. And so if you, your spirit isn't strong enough or potent enough to actually animate the psyche and to make it, you know, elucidated and, and give the volition of the soul some energy to express itself, then we end up, you know, living very meager lives. And um, that might be okay for some, that might even be the entire life path of, of many people and the learning sure. lessons that they need. But I feel that the reason why depression levels are so high in the West and why people are experience so much anxiety and neurotransmitter and hormone disruptions and all of these other things are really because they lack the, the, the discipline to be able to move through those states. And uh, they lack a lot of, of uh, spiritual energy to be able to animate their and to make them feel that they actually energy to do what they want to individualistically do, because it's not about just going to school, getting a career, having kids and then dying. That's right. not, 
you know, life is all the things that you draw away from it uh, while those things are happening in the background. Absolutely. And, and you know, um, I think, unfortunately, one of the characteristics of this Western culture has become that it is I mean, I just keep thinking about the way, even the way that we educate our young or the education system, it's actually creating a, a trauma response. Like it's a traumatic, <laughs> y- you know, like the way that we raise, it's like, um, uh, it's like training a dog, right? Or training yeah. a horse. And we're treating people like this. I don't even think we should treat dogs or horses like that, you, you know, yeah, but it's like, it's agree. this spanking the kids and, and, and then forcing them to go to school and forcing them to, you know, you've got to sit in this desk for this amount of hours and get up when the bell rings and, and, and go to the bathroom when we give you permission, this, this very military style of following orders, this hierarchy that the Western somewhere, uh, along the line, you know, Western culture went down this path, uh, and it and it separates people from this spiritual energy that gives them the strength to overcome the the trauma bonds that they have, but also strengthens the trauma bonds, creates the trauma bond. You know, yeah. so we're all like trauma bonded to whatever the government or you know, yeah, money. so that we're working for them. Yeah, yeah. Instead of us, you know, working for ourselves or our family or, you know, the seventh generation, as as the Native yes. Americans would put it. Um, exactly. Living yeah. on the borrowed earth. Right. So, yeah, I, th- I think that that's so important. And I think that that's why it's absolutely critical that people perform that psychological work and get rid of the traumas. And, you know, it's not that the trauma that you're going to perform these meditations, all of a sudden the trauma or the traumatic experience, let me say, didn't happen. No, in fact, it did happen. But it's the way that you chose to respond to the trauma that has built up your particular strength in one or more areas. And, you know, everything, even the garden, the the, the vegetables and the fruits and things like that, that I grow in my garden, they experience certain traumas too. If the weather's too hot, that's a trauma. Sure, right. you know? so it's not about eliminating traumatic experience it's about learning how to respond and be able to mine the beneficial nutrient that comes from those traumatic experiences that has made you uniquely you and when you stop trying to eliminate the concept of trauma or fearing future trauma but rather learn how to process it properly then it's just like any herb or metal or material in the laboratory you could look at the starting material and say, oh God, it's just so hard to work on. It's going to take me so long. I'd really rather just not go down. No, instead you just know the processes, you do the thing, you get through it, and then you mine out the precious, precious substance. And so, you know, if there was an allegory of going from lead to gold, you take the lead of your traumatic experiences and you extract from that the gold of uh, your self-realized personality and Mm -hmm. those unique things that happen to you have given you strengths that nobody else is actually likely to have and once you have those and you know what your strengths are um, and also what your weaknesses are now you can maybe work on some of your weaknesses and try to create balance or you can continue to polish your strengths or immerse yourself consciously in more traumatic growing experiences so that you can continue to uh, develop new strengths in new ways. And there's myriad ways of going about it. And your discipline will ultimately help to foster whatever pathway that you kind of choose to go in that regard. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that that's absolutely critical uh, that people begin thinking in those, those ways and start thinking that, you know, the traumatic experiences that I've had actually are the things that I needed in order to come to the realizations of of what I now have. But unless you think about it like this, unless you really go through the processes to to get to that point, they're always going to be painful and you'll end up shying away from uh, traumas and shying away from who you authentically are and wishing that you were just this absurd, uh, illogical concept of normal. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) right. (laughs) There's no such There's thing. There's no as such that. thing. Sorry. Yeah. yeah <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, that's the thing. You know, if you try to avoid the trauma, and this is such a good point that you're talking about, is that actually it's not the trauma itself that's causing the issues, but it's the what it's the inability to process them effectively and properly. Um, exactly. And even you know, if you're having problems in the present day, you need to go back to your past and and process those traumas more more effectively and learn, like you're talking about, learn the lesson. Uh, in order to get over it. And then you can have the the healthy mind, body, and spirit that we're talking about. So yeah, very great points. Um, And trying to avoid trauma altogether, of course, uh, is, 
is a trauma is an unhealthy trauma response. <laughs> um, yes, very much so. It's unhealthy. So you know the whole uh, key aspect really of of alchemy is to be able to take something that has uh, value, but maybe little value or lesser value, like lead. And being able to, through a series of very specific processes and methodologies, being able to uh, exalt that material first. And so that's what we call the minor transformation or the minor cycle, mm -hmm. um, the lesser cycle sometimes, so to speak. And then once that material is exalted, now it comes down to being able to uh, perfect it or to transmute it into something that's entirely indistinguishable from what it was as its starting material. And those two processes, exaltation and transmutation, are available to absolutely every, every individual and uh, to every substance, regardless of their nature. And I think that that's really, for my part, that's why alchemy has so much uh, importance and so much relevance in the modern world, perhaps maybe now more than ever, because we're seeing such mass levels of, you know, decay in our spiritual mm -hmm. lives, in our psychological lives, in our physiological lives, you know, so much decay, so many toxins, anywhere that there's an imbalance, imbalance is another term for disease. And so um, anytime that we see imbalanced materials or diseased materials, it just gives us the opportunity to be able to perform this work. So for somebody like me, our modern world is like a heyday. It's like, oh man, I could just continue working right. on things <laughs> in perpetuity and never get bored. Um, well, so that's a great, I, that's a great way to look at it. I tell you that because it's easy to get, uh, it's easy to look around and just get depressed about things, you know? So it, you, you know, it's a great way to have a positive yeah. attitude when you see like all the, all the good works that you can do given the current situation, instead of dwelling on what's actually going on right now. Cause yeah, when you're empowered with alchemical philosophy and knowledge and know-how, everything becomes an opportunity for you. And so there's, you know, it would be damn near impossible to get bored uh, taking a look at right. the state of the world now. It's just like an endless field of opportunities of how do I create solutions to the impending problems that exist? And it becomes really fun, actually. Um, not to say that I wouldn't prefer it, that uh, more people find solutions that we start to use more solutions. But you know, the solutions for the most part have already existed to almost every single one of the problems that we, we could possibly imagine. And in fact, mm. it's like uh, the concept of the yin within the yang and the yang within the yin. Right. Is that every time that a problem is created, the solution is contained within the very essence of the problem. And and the same, the, the reciprocal is also true, you know, vice versa. So, yeah, hopefully, you know, the little bits of inspiration are getting out to uh, your listeners and, and other people who have listened to me talk on other shows in the past and just like sure. lighting up like, oh, my God, I just, you know, if I just focus for just a little bit and learn these basics, then it's just like it's an open field, man. And you mm -hmm. can do whatever you want. And there's tons of room economically and monetarily and, you know, within the structure of what already exists to make enormous changes personally, in your community, in your state, in your country, in the world. Right. And we just have to think, what can we do next that is the most feasible with the materials that we have? Because, you know, hell, I might want to work on some really expensive materials. That's been true for years. But unless you can afford 20 to 40 year old American ginseng roots, for instance, yeah, right. <laughs> um, I'm not going to be able to work on those all the time. It's going to be a rare instance. And so you work on what you have locally and available to you and you make your change that way. And that's, that's going to be I think the, the future narrative of how things continue to progress as dismal as they might seem from the, you know, the current vantage point. Yeah. It's a great way to think about it. I mean, you know, one of the interesting things that I, I guess happened to me as being a part of the cannabis industry and actually just kind of using some of this, this alchemical knowledge, you know, just to create some of the astra, uh, um, extracts that were, uh, economically viable part of the process, yeah. you know, um, and, and then realizing like, I mean, I, I even, you know, I'm tripping out on how, uh, I mean, there, there's actually parallels to say the petroleum industry that does a distillation of the crude oil into the different, you know, this is what our society is founded on, but it's literally founded on these same principles uh, of, of alchemy that you're talking about. I mean, the same way of, of distilling out the various grades of different things, this is how all resources are, are manufactured into goods. 
Uh, and, and so just thinking about it economically is actually kind of fascinating too. Um, you know, not just making medicines, but refining things into other useful products as well. I mean, this is, um, it's a, just a different way of looking at, at all of life, but it, it can be a foundation of a different kind of, of economic system as well that, that actually functions, um, because it is essentially the same. That's why it's almost interesting that they've just twisted alchemy into chemistry by removing the spiritual aspect. Uh, but it's uh, it's almost essentially the same thing. I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Because I don't know, it just seemed like a big deal to me when I realized that what I was doing with my still uh, just, you know, to, to extract the, the, the Rick Simpson oil from the hash or from the cannabis, you know, was essentially the same as what a large manufacturing plant might be doing to manufacture just about anything. I mean, it it was kind of, uh, you know, a level of awareness I just hadn't really understood before because, and because it's so accessible to anyone that has a pot and can make a still, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, here's, here's my thought about that is that the processes of alchemy are holographic and fractal and perennial. And so, Great. you know, they work on all levels, physical, spiritual, psychological. But it's like I was talking about earlier, if you don't develop an awareness that what you're doing in the physical has any ramification on the spiritual or the psychological, then it's exactly that. There's no conscious awareness that those things are happening. And so they can be exploited in the physical realm in order for any myriad purposes, typically a financial one. Um, That's, Mm -hmm. you know, the interesting magic that's been kind of put and and put into place by various powers that be, especially uh, under the terms of modern money mechanics. What that has done is it has substituted true spirituality and spiritual growth for monetary purposes so that money has actually become the spiritual model of all people everywhere in the world. And so whether we're talking about in the West or in the East or, you know, in the South or the North, it really doesn't matter. Money is what unfortunately has. This is so true. Yeah. Yeah. And so realizing that money is a tool and not a life source is absolutely critical. Um, And not just coming to that realization, but also realizing uh, on a very intrinsic level that if you are doing uh, spirituality and psychology and, and proper material practices properly, that money just ends up following. Okay, because it's just part of the resource of this world. And Mm -hmm. so you don't have to try for it. You don't have to try to earn more money to do these things. You just do what is already inherently in your passion and your interest and continue your disciplines. And that in and of itself begins to attract others who say, you know what? I don't know what that person is doing, but that looks fun. They're looking very fulfilled and enriched. They don't have psychological traumas the way that I do. And I want a piece of that. And then they don't follow exactly what you're doing per se. They follow how you did it. (laughs) And that's, that process is by any other term alchemy. When people come to my transpersonal alchemy courses, and I I was very hot. I taught these transpersonal alchemy courses live and online for, uh, well, from about 2009 till, you know, roughly 2013, 2014. And I was teaching them three times a week. And what people would say is like, oh, wow, I have, I inherently understand this process and I inherently understand all of these individual processes. I just didn't know that they all flowed together in order to create something new. And it's like, well, yeah, everybody's using alchemy because, you know, alchemy is for lack of a better term, the art and science of transformation. And since energy is always transforming, from one form to another, it changes from one form to another, which is say transform. Um, Alchemy takes center stage and it's, it really is governing all of the natural principles that we see everywhere around us. Uh, What most people would look at from a biological perspective or an ecological perspective and say, oh, that's evolution. Take a look at the very substance. They are driven, evolution is driven by adaptation to a crisis which is to say that how they respond to a trauma, it's the exact same. Yeah, yeah, totally. And so everything is already a 
happening by alchemy. And the first alchemists were simply watching and observing nature and how nature responded to these various processes of, of catastrophe that would happen and yet create something amazing from it. You know, in the, in the back of uh, the window there, I can see it's all hazy and smoggy and, and, and stuff from all of the fo uh, forest fires that are happening. Yet, if people really are interested in this, the char that is being created from the forestry right now is the best, best inoculant uh, uh, or uh, best environment for the inoculant of microbes. Hmm. They serve as little microbial ho hotels. So when we talk about redeveloping a fungal network through the soil, it is dependent upon this first stage, which we would call calcination in order for that to happen. And from all this calcination, the rains will come, you know, winter is upon us, the rains will come and they're going to leach all of the essential nutrients and minerals from that ash deeper and deeper into that soil. And they're going to be filtered eventually uh, through, through the whole process of the soil and going down through multiple layers of bedrock and whatever else. The water will get down into the aquifers. The aquifers will give way to new springs. New life is going to shoot up. Everything is a process in nature. And if you stand back and you look at nature's processes, you see that it's just performing alchemy. The only difference between an alchemist and anybody else is that the alchemist becomes consciously aware of those processes and learns to utilize those processes on micro and macrocosmic uh, levels of awareness and application in order to perform uh, nature's you know, volition in order to help nature, in order to work with nature and to become ultimately uh, an equivalent partner with nature in the development of this world. And we are the only species on this planet that has the capacity to be able to think and rationalize and use our, our faculties in such a way that we can do that. Everything else is subject to the laws of nature. Mankind can break those laws or use those laws and work in tandem with nature. And that's really... I think the lesson that's upon us right now, mm -hmm. uh, as I take a look at everything happening in the world, it's like, as long as people get with the program and realize, hey, I can be an agent of nature or I can be an agent against nature, but it all comes down from a conscious choice and consciously utilizing the principles. Yeah, one of the things that uh, I've been focusing on, I've done a couple of interviews about this, is this idea of scientism. Because yeah. when I analyze science more from this perspective that you're talking about as an alchemist or as a more of a life practice or a discipline, because I think, I, I mean, you can't escape that. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. You, no matter what science you're into, science is a, is a discipline. It's a form of discipline. But people have forgotten that, that it's a process of, of knowing. And instead, they're trying to pretend like it knows. It, we have already know. Science has proven this, so this is true. And, yeah. and that's like another religion. That's a totally different point of view. Yeah. And it separates us from these natural processes. It tries to transcend those natural processes, and, and it turns it into something else. And it's just something that's been you know, kind of bothering me lately that so many people, I mean, with the COVID-19 thing that's going on, um, and everybody wants to, or even the, the great vaccine debate, you know, science yeah. has proven this and this is true. And I get that over and over again. And it's like, well, I can t I can show you two peer reviewed scientific papers that say the exact opposite. <laughs> See, and that's the thing. I, if there's one thing that I want people to understand is that to approach something scientifically is a smart idea. But science can, ni can neither prove nor disprove anything. Science is just a, a method of inquiry to be able to find more data points. And the more the data points corroborate, that is an indication that this is approaching a more perennial truth. And you also have to realize in the modern day that science, just as easily as anything else, can easily be manipulated by holding on to what you want to be true and performing and framing out a scientific inquiry within the context of trying to prove something. And that's not very good science. That's actually very bad scientific inquiry because the scientific uh, process of inquiry is all about trying to be as objective as possible, mm -hmm. trying to find out what is the most true given a series of truths, variables, and controls in order to be able to, to approach that. And when you try and take something like a pharmaceutical company might do. They take something and they try and perform science on it saying, well, we know that this is true and that this will do this. So let's form an experiment that 
demonstrates that. That's bad science. Yeah. Much better science is saying, let's take this material, apply it to something and just observe what happens and write realistically about what we observed. And when you do that, science cannot be used to prove or disprove anything. It's just another observation with the understanding that there are controls and variables that if we can control or cause, uh, you know, get rid of certain variables and eliminate them further, then we might have an even better understanding based on a more neutral state of observation, but it has nothing at all to do with trying to prove or disprove anything. And the moment that science has a prerogative, it has lost all of its potency. Yeah, it's crazy. And I think that when people start to think that science has proven something they and they lose the open-mindedness, they just start to miss, they miss, uh, you know, they kind of miss the point and they miss a lot of the opportunities to learn uh, a, a lot of other things that are going on. And then like you're talking about this confirmation bias completely sets it up to where they're doing experiments only to prove what they think they already know yeah. uh, instead of coming at it as a part of this process of learning. Um, yes. Yeah, and it's, and, it's unfortunate. And it's, you know, again, that's pushed through because of monetary purposes. You know, there's somebody investing in the making of that medicine. And so the, you know, double blind clinical studies and all of the other things that they're trying to do, they are setting it up in such a way to push the prerogative that this substance is good or it does what it does so that they can ultimately make the return on their investment. And it's behind the scenes. It's all based on money magic. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. you know, once people learn those principles, they'll be able to see that for a fact. And then, you know, the concept of science or peer reviewed science or whatever, it's not that it loses its magic, but it changes the, the context from the way that you look at things and you just understand like, oh, yeah, they obviously have a prerogative. So I need to take this as one perspective of the observation that could be had uh, by performing this experiment. If we were to do it without a bias then what does the observation look like? And, you know, without fail, it seems to be that the, the observation actually changes. The, the thing that you're observing actually changes because again, observation, the angle that you observe something from is creation. That's the way that you perceive it. That's the way that you talk about it and perpetuate it. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to always go back to that phrase. My observation is creation. We just have a few minutes left, and I think I would like, um, I've been wondering what, you know, sort of the last uh, couple questions maybe I, I wanted to ask you, but I think um, I'd like to get some little explanation of how do you perceive disease and how do you diagnose disease, and then what do you, you know, how do you decide to treat uh, someone with, with disease? I was reading um, about your own personal experience, actually, where you got uh, very sick a couple of years ago. And went through this process of learning how to how to treat yourself um, almost intuitively. It seemed finally at the end when you discovered the the uh, the treatment that you needed. But um, but what is the you, you know with now we don't have too much more time. But in in the sim, in the simple uh, yeah, do it. couple of words, yeah, let us just let us know how you diagnose disease and how you treat disease then. Sure. Well, I have to be very careful about using those terms. So I will just make the disclaimer that I never diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease or illness because I'm not FDA approved uh, and I'm not enough. a medical physician. Right. But um, the way that a disease would be diagnosed historically from a spagyric perspective is to take into account five different causes. Um, and these are what Paracelsus created. He says that there's Ains astrale, the cause of disease due to the stars and the positions of the planets. Then there's ains uh, naturale, which is like uh, your diet, your lifestyle, your constitution, the environment that you live in, so on and so forth. Then there's ains veneni, which is cause of disease due to toxins. Ains spirituale, the cause of disease due to spirits, which we would now call uh, things that affect your hormones and neurotransmitters or your hormones and neurotransmitters themselves, like they're biosynthesis, and so on and so forth, uh, as well as outside uh, influences of spirits too. But usually usually those things don't impact you like uh, negative spirits, entities, demons, the way that people would conceive of them. They actually, they're electrochemical and, or they're electromagnetic. And so what they do is they interact with your electrochemistry, which is to say your nervous system or neurotransmitters and your hormones, which are 
your endocrine system. And so that's, that's why I say it's hormones and neurotransmitter base and spirituale. And then finally, ends dei, the cause of disease due to God, which really um, Paracelsus would have attributed this to God. I would say that um, uh, like just to follow that same train of thought, it would be like if you're not here doing what the volition of your soul is meant to be doing, then that's inhibiting you from living your true purpose. Uh, Paracelsus would have conceived that as God having retribution on you for not living into your fullness. But um, however you want to think about that uh, in modern day terminology, we'd say, if you're not doing what you want to be doing, you're selling your soul for a nine to five, maybe that's creating the psychological stress that's creating your disease. So there's lots of ways of conceiving it and you don't have to think about it as, as God per se, or a divinity causing these diseases, but uh, still something around the principles uh, in, in involved in that create disease. So, we take into account these five different things, and I use intrinsic data field technology, which is basically a quantum scalar analysis instrument that is able to uh, be able to, from, from a distance, be able to analyze which of these five causes might be at the root of a, a certain person's imbalance. And then from there, uh, it's just finding out what, you know, inquiring about all of the things that can create those things. So if it's Enzastrale, then I go through the planets. Is it Sol, Luna, Mercury, Venus, Mars, you know, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. that are out of balance. And then uh, from there, it comes down to performing natal sidereal astrology, finding out where the planets were actually at at the time of a person's birth, because that's their astral snapshot, so to speak. That's where their body feels most at home. And in the course of planets being able to move in their positions, uh, at some time, some of the positions that the planets arrive at are going to be very congruent with your wellness and with your purpose and with your mission from an astral perspective. And sometimes they're going to be very incongruent. And when they're incongruent, the harmony of the spheres, uh, to talk about Pythagorean terminology, it uh, creates dissonance instead of harmony. And that dissonance uh, ultimately ends up creating dissonance in your astral body and then into your etheric body, which would be your meridians, and then into, or nadis if you're in, into the Eastern system, mm -hmm. and then finally into the physical body. And there's that chain of command. So it goes, you know, spiritual, causal, but then astral, etheric, physical. And so uh, that's how that one practically impacts people. Then uh, ends naturale might be like, okay, what foods are you eating? And uh, if you're eating a whole lot of damp foods and you have diseases of dampness, like you're holding on to too much weight or you have phlegm in your throat, you know, damp phlegm, mm -hmm. you're constantly clearing your throat, things like that, then it lends to reason that you are eating too many of those things for your particular constitution energetics at this time, uh, which again, it's all about time because the seasons of the year like winter will be more damp and cold and spring will be more damp and warm. And so if you don't experience problems, except for in the winter and the spring, then, you know, it's obvious that you don't need to cut those things out of your life forever. But during certain seasons, you have to be able to curtail these things so that you don't uh, come up with these diseases. Um, and then, you know, it just continues to go on like that. So once we find the root cause, uh, one of those five causes that Paracelsus talked about, then it just comes down to addressing the imbalance that exists. And um, there are numerous different ways of doing that, either through diet and lifestyle or through sending vibrational frequencies like I do uh, with my intrinsic data field uh, work or being able to uh, address planetary imbalances, either through IDF or talisman making, or, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways actually of approaching it. Um, and then spagyrics, uh, they come in because every different herb and every different metal and material has not only a planetary signature to it, but it also has a unique uh, qualitative signature to it. So like for instance, oregano is very warming and it's dry. And so if somebody has too much dampness, especially in the winter time, I might give them a spagyric of oregano that's able to uh, cancel out their dampness and help to dry and resolve that damp phlegm that they might yeah. have and it specifically works on, on that level. And so uh, spagyric pharmacopoeia and energetic medicine and, uh, you know, or vibrational medicine, however you want to refer to that and diet and lifestyle all go hand in hand in the concepts of, 
of uh, spagyric cosmology and uh, medical spagyria. And so that uh, is the research that I've been doing, reconstructing all of Paracelsian works and putting them into the context of a post-scientific society so that we can uh, begin to see what truly works and what is truly perennial and what doesn't. And I'm very interdisciplinary because I work with uh, Ayurvedic medicine and uh, TCM uh, a great deal and cross, um, cross pollinate and interface ideas and bounce things off because again, what works is what works. And so whether Paracelsus talked about something or not is limited to his awareness and it's also limited to whether it works or it doesn't work. And if I can see two, three, 4,000 years of TCM working mm-hmm. or right. people, <laughs> then for me, the proof is in the pudding and whether Paracelsus was aware of it or not, he's not the end all be all. He is just the individual who gave me the ideas on whose shoulders I stand, but I have the freedom and the ability to adapt and to create new uh, tenants uh, within the cosmology to be able to keep it alive. Because if something isn't growing, if it's not adapting and evolving constantly, then it's not really alive. Well, that is super cool. I mean, it's uh, it's awesome to kind of get a, an idea of the bigger picture of, of alchemy here. And I, I think, um, like we kind of talked about at the beginning, uh, just a little bit, it's a Western tradition that people um, from a Western background, uh, as as you said, I think epigenetically we have it in in our in our bodies and to know that there's something in our history that we can bring forth that creates this philosophy um, that incorporates spirituality into our lives and uh, helps to create a a balance Um, because it seems like, I mean, to my mind right now, so many of these, so many other cultures are, have been on this path and the Western culture was on this path as well, 500 years ago. And it's just taken this turn uh, into this, into this scientific materialistic universe, um, you know, just for the last three or four or 500 years. And, uh, if we want to get back in balance, I think we need to find within our own culture, a lot of these traditions that, that can bring about uh, the kind of change that we need so that our lifestyles can start to be in harmony with the state of nature. And we can stop doing this environmental damage that we're doing and stop traumatizing ourselves, uh, you know, <laughs> in the process. So, um, yes. really appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, just a couple of minutes left. If you want to uh, have a few last words or just let people know where they can learn more about your work, um, you know, please go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, for anybody who's interested in uh, my work or, or really resonates with the message that I have, uh, this takes tremendous amounts of research time and tremendous amounts of laboratory time. Um, and not all of the lab work actually turns into something that actually pays off or that you can, you know, put monetary value on. And so I have relied for many, many years just on supporters who uh, really enjoy my work. Instead of doing something like a Patreon model, uh, what I do is I have a very large spagyric apothecary so that individuals who are interested in trying uh, various spagyric tinctures and essences and and uh, magistries and different items of spagyric pharmacopoeia that I have over 220 items available right now. And your purchase of, of any of those items continues to fund my work as well as uh, the education that I offer. So I teach people to do the same work. I have a teachable uh, page that has uh, two courses on it. One is free. And that's an introduction. It's called a brief introduction to uh, spagyric theory and cosmology or spagyric theory and philosophy, something like that. And then I have another one called Spagyria 1010 that teaches people how to make uh, spagyric tinctures. And I'm constantly working on more of those. So we've got more of them filmed, just not released. I also have some group workshops coming up here uh, really soon, October 17th. I have one on expert fermentation skills for the home and lab. So even if you're not interested in being an alchemist, Perhaps you might want my recipe, my famed recipe of the Pictish Heather Ale uh, that is a non-hopped Gruet uh, Ale that has its uh, roots back 5,000 years ago or how to make uh, Ethiopian mead, which we call Tej, and how to be able to perform different types of ferments for your garden, which we call Alchema preps, or you know, in Korea, they call those Jadam, and how to do lots of different things like that in order to drive the diversity on a very low budget and be able to make your own ferments so that you're not uh, constantly shelling out tons of money and getting poisoned by aluminum or having to deal with subpar carbon dioxide in your beers. 
Um, and then we also have another one on November 14th, which is going to be the alchemical water work. And that one is very, very particularly interesting. It's how to take nothing other than rainwater, snow water, dew water, et cetera, different types of water sources, and to be able to craft those into alchemical grade medicines uh, for the soul, the spirit, and the body as well, uh, as well as to learn some very interesting things about how uh, how chemical evolution actually does happen, how you can demonstrate it to yourself, how there's no belief uh, required. You just perform the processes and you see it work before your very eyes. So uh, we've got those and all of my education all lends to uh, supporting this research. And then uh, if you have wellness issues that you would like to have inquired about, I also offer uh, intrinsic data field wellness uh, uh, research programs so that um, people can understand their wellness within a context of uh, spagyric medicine, what it would look like historically, and then uh, also historical and, and even modern ways of being able to address the imbalances that we find. And so uh, all of that's available on my website. It's a very exhaustive website. If you have any questions, just drop us a line, support at phoenixaurelius.org, and uh, we'd be more than happy to hear from you. And thank you in advance for your support. Very cool. Yeah. And I'd recommend uh, everybody go check it out, phoenixaurelius.org. Um, it's uh, fascinating and I have enjoyed learning about it. It's something that I've kind of touched on uh, and been on the fringes of for a long time. And uh, so it was great having this conversation with you, Phoenix, and, and learning so much more. And I'll be looking forward to learning more in the future. So thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Man, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Right on. And I'll just let people know that I have been your host. My name is Doug McKenty. You have been watching The Shift with Doug McKenty. I'm on YouTube and Facebook at The Shift with Doug McKenty, on Twitter at D McKenty, and uh, find us on the web at www.theshiftnow.com. I uh, hope you check it out and think about subscribing there. And there's also uh, lots of free content on there as well. I'm doing uh, currently another program called the Roundtable Discussions. I'm putting that up on the website this week. I've got 15 episodes of that too uh, with a production company called Transparent Media True. So I just want to let my audience know about that so you can you know, hit the website, and check those out. Um, so uh, again, thanks Phoenix for being on the program. And uh, we'll keep in touch, I think. Uh, I, I really appreciate what you're doing, and I can't wait to learn more. So, Awesome. Uh, Thank you so much. I very much so appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, you bet. Uh, have a great day. Thanks again. Well, all right, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for listening to that episode of The Shift featuring Phoenix Aurelius, the uh, modern-day alchemist. Um, what a fascinating conversation. I really enjoyed talking to him about the difference between alchemy and science and where alchemy is going. My favorite thing about having that conversation with him, I mean, we did a comparison and contrast between uh, European alchemy and traditional Chinese medicine. I know he's done work in, uh, in uh, Ayurvedic medicine as well and learned some indigenous plant medicine on top of that. So he is really capable of doing like comparison and contrast between uh, this type of alchemy that has European origins and all of the different traditions from around the world. And my favorite thing I think that I've gotten out of uh, doing the research and having this conversation with him is this notion that so many of us of European ancestry, no matter where we are now in the world, uh, we've really been severed from our European roots, the European roots that presented to us uh, a natural, holistic, integrated version of reality. We've all been raised in this uh, this postmodern, quote-unquote, scientific uh, world where uh, we've been taught to objectify and separate uh, from the natural world and uh, to not be a part of it, to be outside of the Garden of Eden, as it were. And so to talk to someone that is from a European tradition that really um, works within the state of nature uh, to create uh, a holistic philosophy, uh, a lifestyle um, that works in harmony with the state of nature and not in uh, opposition to it, I think is a real solution uh, for so many of us that have been raised uh, in this post-colonial mindset. Um, you know, the European countries went around the world and imposed this mindset uh, on a lot of people, which was interesting to talk to him even about uh, the traditional Chinese model, where the Maoist communists then try to separate 
the internal alchemy from uh, the traditional Chinese medical practice and say, oh, this is just a bunch of, of hooey. Uh, it's not really true. Um, this doesn't really happen. It was, it was great to have that conversation with him about my own experience uh, doing Tai Chi and doing Qigong um, because, like I told him, I have uh, lots of empirical evidence uh, that the energy system inside me functions exactly like the traditional Chinese would say that it did. Um, also, the Ayurvedic practitioners from India and from many parts of the world who have studied the, this internal alchemy uh, since the human race began. <laughs> Um, but uh, our knowledge and understanding of how it works uh, has been severed in this uh, post-colonial age. So it's really nice to see a European tradition that joins with these other world traditions, these ancient traditions that understand how the alchemy works uh, and the importance of it as a, a holistic, uh, spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, as well as physically and materialistic. So, uh, you know, all the components of life come together in one system of health. Uh, and having a conversation with him, too, about economics was actually really interesting, and I didn't expect to go there, but to uh, d just discuss how being self-sufficient and self-sustainable and living the whole lifestyle that comes with uh, being an alchemist, being able to provide yourself with the herbs that you need to do. The alchemy also means, you know, growing your own food. The herbs and the medicine and the essences comes from oftentimes edible plants, uh, and so it ties you in. The kind of water that you're using, the way you're growing the alcohol, the kind of yeast that you're using, and of course the notion of using uh, whole plants to make these essences uh, so that you're really getting the spirit of the plant and using their energy to balance the imbalance and the disharmony inside the diseased person. Um, just what a refreshing conversation and, and, and what a good idea, I think, for people of European heritage, since we're all so interested in learning about and living in uh, a diverse reality now um, and ex being accepted accepting of all different kinds of points of view to realize that uh, within European heritage there is a system that's so similar uh, to the African or indigenous American or traditional Chinese systems or Indian systems all around the world. So um, for those of us with European heritage, it's, it's good to be able to dive back into some of that and to start to uh, get over this um, post-colonial or colonial mentality that we've had for so long since many of our cultures uh, were destroyed by the Romans initially, and you know the story goes on from there. But we've all we've all been colonized at one time or another. So learning this knowledge of of all of our indigenous uh, uh, heritage and understandings and what has grown from that, it's great that Phoenix still keeps all of that knowledge alive and that he was able to share some of that with us today. So uh, if you like what you heard, please check uh, out more of his work at www phoenixaurelius.com. Really interesting website. You can uh, see what he's got for sale in the apothecary and learn more about him there. Uh, I'd also like to tell people because I had uh, a listener tell me today that, hey, you know, I listen to your free stuff and I, I'm not a subscriber, but, it, you know, I get the whole interview every time and I just wanted to let you all know that I actually do cut a good 25 to 50% out of each episode, and my subscribers are getting that extra little bit. I just do like to make the, the cut kind of seamless, and I don't make a big deal out of it. So maybe I've been too good about that, uh, because you do get a little bit extra uh, in terms of what you can listen to if you subscribe to the website. It's uh, six bucks a month if you check, it, check out the site at www.theshiftnow.com and hit subscribe. Uh, you can also find out more about my show, The Shift with Doug McKinty, on Facebook and YouTube at The Shift with Doug McKinty. I'm on Twitter at D McKinty, and of course the website again, theshiftnow.com. So thank you so much for listening. Hope you check out Phoenix's stuff. I had a great conversation with him, and I will be back next week. So uh, take care of yourself. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you then. Take care. <music>